Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to Virtually 2023, uh, Nementa's free virtual web accessibility and digital inclusion conference. Uh, big thanks to Amani for her great talk earlier on designing for the neurodiverse. Um, we're going to have the recordings of all this week's talks available right after the conference ends on Thursday. Uh, we are joined uh, by my clear text who are providing live captions. Um, you can access these by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of Zoom, or alternatively, we have provided a stream text link uh, in the chat for a page of fully adjustable captions. Um, for our next talk, though, uh, we welcome uh, back to virtually Heather Hepburn, Accessibility Lead at Skyscanner, who is going to be sharing Skyscanner's accessibility journey, speaking on their accessibility program and the challenges faced and lessons learned along the way. Uh, please do get involved in the discussion and say hello in the chat. Um, as always, we'd love to know where in the world you're tuned in from. Uh, make sure your chat settings are switched to everyone and not just uh, hosts and panellists. And that way everyone can see your messages. Um, and if you've got any questions for Heather, please do submit them using the Q&A box. Um, and I'll try and get through as many as I can with her at the end. Um, so yeah, over to you, Heather. Great, thank you. Hi, everybody. Really nice to be here. And thank you so much, Nomensa, for having me. Um, yep, yeah, um, my name's Heather Hepburn. I'm the Accessibility Lead at Skyscanner. And I'm really, really wanting to share today uh, a bit about our accessibility programme. So I'm going to talk about how we got started, um, a bit of a timeline of events and the progress that we've made along the way. Um, I'll show you some case studies that might be of interest. Um, we'll take a look ahead at some stuff that we're working on this year and I'll share some lessons learned at the end. And I'm just I'm just hoping that it might give you some ideas to try yourself or at least let you find out a bit more about what we're doing um, and how we do things at Skyscanner. Uh, so if you don't know us, um, Skyscanner are an online global travel brand. We're a meta search company and we offer uh, options of flights, hotels and car hire to our travellers. Um, we've got just over 1300 staff uh, and they're based um, in nine offices across the world. So three in the UK, we've got uh, the furthest away is in China in Shenzhen. And we translate what we do into 35 different languages, which means we can operate in 200 markets across the world. And at the moment, we have just over 100 million active users every month. Um, so people do like our, our website and our apps. Um, a little bit about me. I'm, uh, I was a UX writer for seven years at RBS before I joined Skyscanner. Um, I joined Skyscanner as a UX writer, and it was actually during my interview process um, where I realised that accessibility maybe wasn't being prioritised in the way it should. I was asked to do a, a UX critique of our iOS app over a weekend, like four interviews down or something, and um, I very, yeah, it was very obvious that accessibility wasn't being considered. So I, I really wanted to, to change that. And uh, about six months to nine months after I started as, a, as the writer, I wrote a job description for myself as accessibility lead and they let me do it. So that was about three years ago. So the, um, the program has been running for three years and I'm excited to be telling you a bit more about it today. Um, I'm also the co-founder of an external uh, group called the Champions of Accessibility Network, or CAN. I'll tell you a bit more about that later as well. And uh, as many of you will be on the same mission, I, I feel very much on a, on a big mission to try and improve accessibility uh, across the world. So just a, a recap of the content, I'll show you, share my journey so far, accessibility improvements that we've made through some case studies. Uh, I'll look at what's next for us, I'll share our learnings and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, okay, so the beginning of our journey was really about finding like-minded folk. It's the best place to start. Um, I, When I started at Skyscanner, I found the Accessibility Guild Slack channel. So there were about 70 people on there at the time. I wrote a note going, hey, hi. I'm excited about starting. Um, I've come from the bank. We did accessibility there. What what can I do? What are you doing? You know, can I can I help? And it was the tumbleweed moment. There was not a lot of response other than a nice few nice polite hi hi. Uh, so it became apparent that nothing was really happening. Um, so I got I got people together uh, in a room in Edinburgh, 
back in March 2019. I think there were 30 of us or so. And we talked about what had happened, what had tried, what we tried in the uh, in the past, why things hadn't necessarily stuck. Um, and I was so motivated by that conversation that when I came out, I just really had to do something about it. Um, and I'm pleased to say that actually since March 2019, we have met up every month since then and still continue to do so. And that was the part that was the beginning of our Accessibility Champions Network. Um, so the pictures on screen um, are, are not a normal meetup of our champions, but this is um, a Christmas night out in Edinburgh in the pub and a, a group in London in, the, in, a, in a pub as well. And we chatted to each other while we were doing this and sharing some drinks and some stories. So uh, we're, we're a good, a close group. Um, so when I came out of that meeting, I was motivated. And I really wanted to get things moving. So I needed some cash to do that. Um, so I wrote a proposal and I went to my manager for approval who said, yeah, it sounds great. I went then to the head of design because I was in the design team um, and they were like, yeah, this is great. You need to take it to uh, Piero, um, who is our chief product officer and he is one of the execs. Um, so I did. He told me to go write a business case. Um, so there's loads of information out there on how to write a decent business case for accessibility and I won't go into details on that in this talk, um, but it, mine focused in three main areas and those were the commercial reasons for it, the legal reasons for it and the moral reasons, which the moral reasons were by far our biggest draw card for this. this we, I've never worked for a more inclusive organization and I can't imagine many more inclusive organizations out there um, than Skyscanner. And for them to um, be knowingly excluding people from, from using our products was just, did not sit well at all. Um, and it really, it really came from a place of not knowing um, about much about accessibility, that why we were in that position in the first place. So it was, it was a reasonably easy sell. Um, and so I got a little bit of money to kick things off. Um, and just to say, actually, Piero is now my manager. Um, I don't know about you guys, but accessibility is sometimes it's quite hard to find the right fit in a business for where should it sit. I've been in the design team. I've been in the engineering team. I've been back in design. Um, and I did ask, I'd asked Piero um, a while ago, can I not just report to you? It would, it would be a bit easier. You know, you own the whole product. This is be easier. He said no the first time, but um, the second time he called me relentless and said yes. So it's all good. It's great, actually. It's, it's, it's very beneficial having him as, as a manager. So, um, yes, I got the funding and I reached out to Nomensa, um, who came and did an amazing workshop with us. Alistair Campbell ran that for us. And um, they also carried out an audit of our design system components. I was thinking if we can get our components into a good accessible state, you know, we're half, you're halfway there when you're, when you're building products. So that was really worthwhile. And um, I reached out to AbilityNet as well. And Adi Latif from AbilityNet came and did a talk to us. Um, which was brilliant having that lived experience in the room. He's a blind usability consultant. Um, it was great for him to get um, people really understanding why this was so important that we did it. Um, from there, Piero asked me to, to go work on a new project that was our, uh, our new mobile website. So it was a nice small place to start. And the, the thinking was if we start somewhere small, we can learn then how best to tackle accessibility in a business like ours and then work out how to scale it um, properly. So this really was a great idea and a really nice place to start. So I was working with the designer, the content writer, I was working with a squad of developers and the product owner, and we really were embedding accessibility from the beginning and it made such a huge difference. We were auditing as well as we were going and learning where our issues were. Um, and it was the first time that we ever tested properly with um, disabled users. So we tested with blind users and we tested with a group of dyslexic users. Um, and I must say the, the insight that came from those sessions was phenomenal. Uh, I would recommend testing with disabled users above and beyond anything else to really understand if your product actually works. Um, so from there, it was time to start thinking about the scaling element of it. So I had to go and build more of a strategy around it. Um, something that came out of it that we still use a lot all the time uh, is our vision. 
Um, and this is hugely important to, to me. I, I find having a vision like this written down makes everything kind of make sense. And all of the work we do kind of leads back to this vision. Um, so the vision is to make Skyscanner a flagship of disability inclusion, our products accessible to all and travel easier for people with disabilities. And that really breaks down into three areas. So the flagship of disability inclusion is all about our people. Um, how can we understand our disabled colleagues better? What positive changes can we make to make their working lives um, easier and allow them to thrive? And then um, the products accessible part is about our travelers. That's about how can we make our websites, our apps, everything we do for our travelers, our marketing, our social comms, everything. How do we make that accessible to absolutely everybody so everyone can enjoy what we do? And then the third part is making travel easier for people with disabilities. So that looks at our industry. Um, and that's about how can we influence our partners and other people in the travel industry to make uh, to make the whole thing more accessible. Um, and that's that's super exciting that because that that really leads to kind of wide scale change. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about what we're doing for that in, in a sec. Um, we also created a bit of a strategy or I stole actually stole this strategy from someone I heard talking at another conference of Sam Solomon from Verizon Media. And um, it was just so simple and I loved it and it made so much sense. Um, so it's just all about starting with raising awareness across the business. And once you've done that for a little while, that allows you to then increase adoption of accessibility best practice. And when you're doing that, you can start talking about it a bit more. You can start advocating for accessibility internally and externally. And that in turn leads to greater awareness and so on. So it's a it's a cycle that keeps on going and keeps getting stronger all the time. Um, I wanted to create a hub of resources as well. So for anybody interested in accessibility, they had somewhere to go. Um, excuse the old branding here. Um, the new branding is this brighter purple, um, but the old branding is uh, actually the hub is still in the old branding. I need to sort that out. Um, but the, the hub contains a load of guidelines for different disciplines. So um, there's different start getting started guides for designers, developers, content writers, project managers. I could add to that as well. I'd really like to. Um, there's notes about testing. This is where we keep all our champions um, information, our case studies, our blogs. Everything is here. It's in one place and it makes it really easy for people to go and find what they need. Um, Something else that we've been doing for quite a while now is um, Empathy Labs. Um, I've got a little video I'll play for you. Uh, but these are, I find them to be the number one most effective thing that we've actually done in terms of raising awareness around accessibility. Um, I'll play this video for you. Empathy Labs are places where we simulate different disabilities and we have set up a lot of um, technology there. So we've got laptops around the room, we've got phones, we've even got a dartboard. And the idea is that um, our Skyscanner employees can sit down and really see things from a different viewpoint, be in someone else's shoes that they might not have ever considered before. By doing it, we really want people to leave with a... I didn't know it was like that for some people. And um, what can I do to change? So we've got some information in there as well that um, highlights what they can do in their daily jobs to make our products more accessible to people with disabilities, but also what they're doing internally. So to make everything more accessible for our staff. I'm an accessibility user myself. So I'm quite passionate about making accessibility for all. Um, I just don't want someone to get left behind like I did when I was younger. So I find it really important as working in the company to give that powerful voice to people that don't have it. It's been super insightful to see all the different challenges that people with different disabilities uh, have. The fact are about things about things are temporary and how things are permanent. Um, it, it's not it's not something I was very aware of, and I can't imagine that many other people are aware of it too. The fact that you can be temporarily disabled, such as having a broken arm or whatever, which would really stop you doing things that you're very used to, like uh, using a mouse or or any other type of computer. So, yeah, just things like that 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 um, you don't really realise that you are more affected by these things 
or perhaps will be in the future. And uh, yeah, it's it's humbling in that way. And I just think that everybody needs to experience our products from these different angles, um, just to understand how people experience the world, how they experience online, which we all take for granted, and we all can use it and find the information we need or get the tasks done that we need. But actually, for some people, they can't do that. With a company that's inclusive, like Skyscanner, or we don't want to uh, disregard people. So everybody should be able to travel and enjoy the world. So no matter whether you're engineering or design, um, internal comms, I think everybody can do their bit. So we, we really do love, we love hosting these. And um, we know that our employees get so much from them. And we do always caveat it heavily with it is not the same as speaking to someone with real lived experience. Um, we are only simulating disabilities and it's not always going to be accurate. And the best thing to do is speak to someone um, with that experience. But um, as a way of doing this on a regular basis, in a way that um, we can get a load of people through the lab at a time, um, it really is fantastic. And we we used to run them kind of at an, on an ad hoc basis, but now the company have asked us to run them at global induction. So that happens every three months. And that's where our new employees come along and they have two days in the Edinburgh office. So they're flown in from wherever they are in the world. They come to Edinburgh for two days and the Empathy Lab is part of, of what we do with them. So they're actually doing one tomorrow uh, for them as well. So yes, they are great. Um, and I'm very happy to share more information on on how we how we set up a lab and what, what kind of stations we have and how, where we get the equipment and everything. It's it's a really cool thing to do. Um, moving on from that, uh, training has been a super important thing for us at Skyscanner. I've since I started in this role, I've been trying to do training um, in different ways. I ended up creating a bit of a two hour training course that I gave to about 45 um, of our squads. So that was mainly to engineers, but also to designers and writers and project managers. Um, and it was a couple of years ago now, but it was effective and um, it was just the beginning of, of the learnings for everybody. So it was great. We're now we've looked at some more scalable options. I created a, a course for our Skyscanner University. So that's where anyone can, can log in and um, learn, any, take any of the courses that we, we hold there. Um, so it's just an hour long thing um, that's there for anyone. And we've just actually signed up to DQ uh, University as well. So we have bought some seats for their full curriculum of online courses. Um, we looked around and, and we figured that they were the, the most suited to our needs. Um, they're cool, they're, it's self-led, it's online, there's different pathways for different disciplines, um, and we actually just rolled it, started rolling it out on Monday, so um, I'm excited about that. Um, advocacy was something that has built up over time, so at the beginning we weren't wanting to talk about it too much um, externally, it was still very new to us. But then we started feeling more confident and, and have written a few LinkedIn articles. We've got an accessibility statement on our web uh, website um, and we joined the Valuable 500. And this was a this was a major milestone for me. This this um, well, the, the Valuable 500 is a group of 500 companies across the world who publicly commit to improving disability inclusion. It's a wonderful organization. Um, they produce a lot of material uh, that's excellent as well. But to join, we had to get our, the CEO's um, signature and his approval for it. So this was the first time that he, um, we have had that kind of buy-in from that level. So it was, it was really great. I'm thrilled to be part of that. Um, and we also have done a disabled um, travel photo shoot from all over the world uh, that we use these beautiful images in our marketing and in our product. And we want to do a lot more advocacy, actually, as time goes on, the more we're, we're doing more and more, which is fab. Um, the Champions Network. Now, as I said at the very beginning, this was this started uh, very casually. We had a, an accessibility guild. It was super informal. We met once a month. We chatted. There was some activity happening, but there wasn't as much as I thought we could have. So um, I actually restructured it a year ago to the day, and we launched this model. So this is where I have I split the network into five different pods. 
and they are discipline specific pods. So our accessibility champions now sit in one of these pods. We've got a product makers pod that um, has product designers, content designers, researchers, and product owners in there. We've got a marketing and comms pod for our PR and comms folk, um, our social media teams, advertising, marketing, branding. Um, then we've got an engineering pod for our web engineers, app engineers, and systems engineers and an internal pod for uh, teams like um, workplace people, our people team, our talent acquisition team. And um, we've got two lawyers in that, in that pod, which is amazing. And then we have an operations pod that is basically myself and um, the four, five pod leads. Um, so I asked, I asked people to, to be pod leads of each of these areas um, and they're helping me run the whole thing, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and since we've done this, the amount of activity coming out of the network has, um, I can't even, I, multiplied by many, many times. Um, people got together in their own teams, had to think about what they wanted to do to improve accessibility in their area, making it more possible for them to do so. And they've come up with plans um, on, on what they want to do and how they want to do it. And they're now implementing that stuff. So. It's fantastic and it, actually the work that's going on here is what makes up my overall roadmap for the year of all of the activity that we're doing in relation to accessibility. So it's it's like having having a team without having a team. Um, and this is this is everyone there. We have um, almost, well, we have almost 80 signed up champs. Um, that was another thing that we changed when we changed the structure. We asked if people to actually onboard, go through a little onboarding process. That's been super successful as well. People have had to do my course on Skyscanner Uni and then have a one-to-one -one with me where we fill in a form. So I've got some data and it's just, yeah, it's really nice. I can talk to people about what they want to learn, um, what activity they might want to do, find out a bit more about them, where they are, um, what, what kind of work that they're doing. And um, I catch up with them every six months, um, each person. So yeah, it's it's been fantastic. And, and I couldn't do this without them. Um, another thing that has been great is reporting. Um, measuring and tracking, it's something that we, we did start um, just over a year ago. And a group of the champions actually uh, manage this side of things, uh, which is fab. We use, a, we use a tool called AQA by UsableNet. It's a, it's a US-based company. Um, and this is an automated auditing tool uh, that we run once a week across a number of pages or journeys that we've, um, that we've detailed on our website and our mobile website. So this only works on, on web. But what it gives us, it gives us an accessibility score. Now, you'll all know this anyway, they're automated audits. So they only, um, they only cover up to a maximum of 40% of potential issues, but it's a great place to start. And I think having metrics like this that we can look at every week, we can see progress. Um, it really works for some people to have a number to hold on to. Now, this does not mean if we were 100% accessible in this, it does not mean that everyone can use us. This is automated only, so it doesn't cover everything. Um, but it has been a brilliant place for us to start. Um, so we're looking at improving this as we go forward. With the same tool, we can do manual audits as well, which would give us way more coverage. Um, but it has, yeah, it's it's been great. And it, we actually... It's, we show those scores on weekly reports that go to all of our um, engineering teams and it sits on our in, um, engineering scorecard as well next to things like security and availability and performance so really really pleased that we're doing this it's been very worthwhile um We've just quite recently launched our new component library or design system. It's called Backpack. Um, there's a QR code there if that if that works. If you can, um, if you want to go straight to it, um, the we have an accessibility consultant who works with um, the Backpack team on making accessible components and writing um, component level accessibility guidance. But they've also put together an accessibility section um, with, with more detailed guidance for different disciplines. So it's been really helpful to have, and it's open source, so you can go in and check that out as well. Um, 
really nice to have and really nice to see the development that's happening in our component library. As I said before, if your components are accessible, you're halfway there to, to having a brilliant accessible product. More than half, I would say. Um, what's next for us? Well, I, I will talk about this a bit more later, but just to say that all of that stuff that I've shown you on that timeline, it, it's really been building over time and I'm so excited about it. But where we're at just now, it feels now like it's a solid program that the business are taking seriously. Um, and that has been proven by the fact that we now have a group, a new group called Positive Impact. Um, and that is the coming together of four areas. So accessibility, sustainability, DE&I and uh, communities, which is our charity area of the business. Um, and we, we meet up um, every, every few months with our exec sponsors. Um, and it's just, it's just been fantastic. It's just make the whole thing um, way more established. And it's all about what impact can we drive from being together as well. And we've presented roadmaps through this group to our CEO and to the exec team for the first time. And it just feels like we're now really embedding it into the business. And I know that it may, may seem like a long time. This We've started this program three years ago, just over three years ago, but it does take time. Um, it takes time to raise that awareness and to get that adoption going. Um, but I feel that we're in a really exciting place now with it. Okay, so I hope you've got some questions, but um, I've got a wee bit more to chat about, but I'm happy to answer anything on any of that that I have shared so far. So case studies, um, just having a look at some accessibility improvements. I just want to share some of this stuff. I also want to say that by no means are our products perfectly accessible. They are not. Uh, areas of them are great. Areas of them are need some work. Um, it's an ongoing process. It's a long journey. Um, we still have a long way to go. But I just wanted to show you some of these um, some of these case studies to bring a few things to life. Um, firstly, our color palette. So a few years ago, we well actually just as I started, so four four and a half years ago, we just rebranded. We had a new logo, and we had a new color palette. So the image on the left shows the old, uh, well, the new at the time. So four years ago, what the color palette was was looking like. Um, beautiful colours, uh, but no real thought to accessibility apart from with our new uh, main colour, which is the sky blue. Um, no rules for accessible colour pairings. So there's a chart there that shows a, a lot of different colour pairings, most of them inaccessible. So the contrast between them is, is not high enough to use. Um, and we were using a lot of that and actually 25% of the issues uh, in our iOS app where color related. So it was quite a serious thing for us. So um, accessibility was the catalyst for changing this. There were other reasons as well, but the design team took a lot of time refining the palette, tweaking the colors, making them more accessible. They made two different palettes. So we have a mark marketing palette, which is full of all the colors. And then we have a more, um, a smaller, uh, sharper palette for product. Um, they thought about night modes more carefully and they created brilliant rules for usage so, so that colour contrast was just never an issue again for us. Um, and that has been quite transformational for our products. That, that's just been rolled out. Um, I think it was the end of last year, beginning of this year, that that's been being rolled out. So that will be solving quite a few of our accessibility problems. Um, our search controls are kind of the main part of our of our site it's kind of our bread and butter it's where people go to say where they want to go to when they want to go um, and start searching for a flight or a hotel or a car um, and I'm showing a before what our search controls looked like and after um, so there's a few a few improvements um, you can see that the heading is easier to read when it's not sitting on an image so on the left we've got white text sitting on a on a photo but on the right in the new version, it's just sitting on a solid background and it's much, much clearer to see. So people with low vision or other vision impairments or dyslexia even um, will, will be able to read that more easily. Um, by moving that image away as well from the, con from the copy, it's, it's way less distracting. Um, and that's really helped our neurodivergent travellers. It's it can be really um, frustrating and and confusing when you're trying to read something with busy busy images going on in the background. 
And we also simplified our search controls so there's less to click on, it's easier to use. Um, and you can also see that our partner information is much clearer. So before it was sitting on the image in white, and now it's it's still on the image, but each image now has a scrim or a, or a gradient that sits darker at the bottom so that our text is always going to be super clear to read. So I was really, I was really, really pleased to get to be working on that um, and seeing those positive changes. Um, keyboard only navigation. Um, this is this is a really important part of, of accessibility. Um, some people are restricted to just using a keyboard, so they can't use a mouse or a trackpad. So everything has to work just by using a tab key and enter and space. Um, so on our site, this is this is a little video of what we used to what it used to look like. Um, this is our search results page. So um, every time I hit the tab key, you can see a number coming up on the screen. Um, so I'm tabbing through. I've I've done my search. I've hit I've hit please search, and this is this is the results. And all I want to do is get to the first result, which is down at the bottom of the screen where that yellow box is. But it's taking me all the way through all of the filters, of which there are many, uh, all the way down to the bottom of the page. I'm still going. What number I was sixty eight hits of the tab key so far, it's still going. And I finally get to the first result after hitting the tab key 78 times. <laughs> Not cool, nobody wants to do that. No keyboard only user would be using us. Um, so we changed it um, we put in a skip link, um, which is a very common uh, um, thing for to have um, to make a page much more accessible, particularly if there's a lot of content on there. Um, so you'll see it coming up, it's a little red box after I tap on the logo, there's a skip to content or skip to results link, I come back to it and then it takes me straight down to that first result, which is three clicks uh, of the nav, three taps of the nav of the uh, tab key and I hit of enter. So much, much better. But I, yeah, I would like to implement a few more of them across the site as well. So plans are, plans are in place to do that. And screen readers, um, as many of you will know this, but screen readers are used by blind and partially sighted people to listen to the content of the screen when they can't read it. Um, it's a hugely important part of accessibility. We find it the hardest part to make something really uh, work for screen reader users. Um, so the example I'm gonna show you is a before and after of just a small part of our car hire app, um, part of the app. Um, and before, if you have a listen, it's it's just it's just very obvious that this has been built without accessibility in mind. So it's not giving enough information to the traveler and have a think about, would you be confident uh, making a decision about this car based on what you can hear? Two, three doors, vertical line, Kia Picanto or similar, manual, AC. Four, one. So just there's there's missing labels. Um, it's it's quite hard to tell what's going on. And after it's a little bit better. Sport Hyundai i20 or similar. Automatic transmission, air conditioning, five passengers, two bags. So just a few labels were added there and suddenly it makes sense um, and it's much better. So we have to do that across everything that we do to make our journey uh, work for um, people who are using screen readers. Um, what's next for us? So these three pillars that I talked about earlier, uh, our people, our travelers and our industry. So as far as the program goes, it is really starting to be embedded into the main company strategy, which makes me very, very happy. Um, the roadmap for 2023 covers activity in all of these three areas, and we're reporting on that roadmap, uh, we're report reporting the progress right up to the CEO, um, so it's been taken seriously. And we're starting to discuss with leadership how we can further embed this activity into other existing company goals that are already happening. Um, so rather than it being this add-on, this side project, it's really starting to be embedded, uh, which is awesome. So for our people this year, um, internally, we're, we're really working on improving the experience of our disabled employees. So looking at improving our policies, our work environments, um, and making our processes more inclusive. So for example, for our hiring, um, 
and we're trying to hire more uh, disabled staff. We've got an ad out there at the moment for a um, blind or partially sighted software engineer to work on our front end. Um, we've got a few people in the process already, so really, really excited about that. Um, and as I said before, we're you know we're doing those talks at Global Induction now, which we didn't we didn't ever do before. So the business are really uh, backing us and wanting us to talk to our new people from the very beginning, which is great. We're also going to be looking at um, growing the Champions Network and upskilling within that Champions Network as well. And then for our travellers, we've got the training that we've just rolled, starting to roll out uh, this week for our accessibility champions first and then across the rest of the business. Um, we're trying to embed accessibility into all of our product development processes. So one of the um, champion network teams are working on that, like defining our definition of done and defining our testing processes better than they, they are at the moment. We're looking at improving documentation and testing. We're looking at improving our auditing processes as well, or particularly with app, um, and making our other comms, like our social media posts and our marketing, um, more accessible through improved guidelines and improved processes. And really wanting to test with more disabled people is something that uh, is is hugely important. Um, and I, I can't tell you how how amazing it is and the insight that you you get from doing that. It's so so worth it. Um, and for our industry, uh, this is a big thing that we're hoping to do later in the year. We've been building a partner accessibility hub, which is basically something for our partners who are airlines and online travel agents um, to say, look, we're, we're not saying we're fabulous at this, but we are saying we've got a great accessibility program. Here's, here's our stuff. So we're giving them our, um, our strategy, our business case, um, our guidelines, uh, how to set things up like a Champions Network, all of that stuff to try to either kickstart um, an accessibility program in their business or to help them boost the existing stuff that's already going on. Um, and I'm really, I'm really excited about that as well. I think that's going to be, that's going to be awesome. So plans are being worked out on how we, how we actually launch this thing. Um, so yeah, it's a busy, it's going to be a busy year. Uh, and just a few of our learnings just to finish up. Um, ah, we've learned so much, so many learnings, but just bringing it down to the top six. Um, if you are just starting out um, or if you're trying to get further than you feel you're getting or coming up against brick walls, these are things that have been really crucial to us. So first up is getting everyone's attention. Um, watching a disabled person struggle to use what you make is so powerful that if you can do that and share that with um, the, your organization or the decision makers in your organization, it is a great way to get people listening um, and get people wanting to, to make a difference. Um, getting leadership on board, uh, obviously it's an obvious one, but I wanted to mention here, yes, I needed that exec sign off to begin with, but what I'm working on now is um, the kind of manager level uh, of leadership the ones who are actually getting the work done. Um, crucially important that they are behind what you're doing and that starts with the raising awareness. There's uh, there's still folks who don't really understand why we're doing what we're doing. So there's work still to be done uh, there and those people need to be on your side. So yeah, getting them on board is really important. Um, I, we have found, you know, making one person responsible uh, a, a, another crucial part of this before I joined and everyone was trying to do stuff but nothing was sticking it was because it wasn't someone's responsibility so as soon as someone is responsible and actually reporting on this stuff suddenly you have strategies in place you have roadmaps you have training getting done you have metrics um it's it's a real it doesn't have to be a huge team <clears throat> um it just needs to be someone's responsibility um I also think educating everybody is key. So some folks, I think, focus on educating just the people who are making stuff or, you know, your product designers and your developers. I think it's amazing to have everybody on board with what you're doing. It also means that you can make everything you're doing internally 
um, accessible to your colleagues, which is great. You want to talk about accessible emails, accessible PowerPoints and Zoom calls. Um, and the more people know about it, the more support um, everyone gets for the work that they're trying to do. And then understanding your issues. So um, we did all that early auditing and we're still doing it once a week um, to have that list of bugs. It's it's great. It's a great place to start. Um, and it, if you can prioritize those and find those low hanging bits of low hanging fruit that are not too hard to fix, but that might be huge blockers to some groups, um, yeah, that's a brilliant way to start and just fix them first and then learn how to do the, the other ones later. Um, and the huge thing for me is starting the Champions Network. I mean, I, yeah, I've kind of got then a kind of team of 80 folk, which is amazing. Um, and it's just the best way to do it. And they are, they are advocating and being the voice of our disabled travellers within their teams every day. Uh, and it, it makes such a huge difference. Um, so just before I finish up, I just wanted to quickly tell you about the external Champions of Accessibility Network, or CAN, um, that I was co-founder of. So um, I started this off with Charlie Turrell and Gareth Ford-Williams, who are both ex-BBC. Um, it's a LinkedIn group, uh, so you can find us and um, click the Ask to Join button. Um, and it's for people in similar roles to me, um, accessibility roles or designers, developers, anyone who's trying to push for accessibility in their organization, um, particularly around champions networks, but it can be really about, about anything to do with accessibility. We, we have a good active channel and link, uh, group in LinkedIn. Uh, we meet monthly, we have a, an online meetup and we have people there from all over the world. It's quite phenomenal. Um, we have people joining from New Zealand at 4 a.m. in the morning for them. It's it's amazing and such a nice group. And each, each month we have a different theme. So we've talked about Empathy Labs training and we've done a social version where we met up in the pub. Um, and one time we had a panel of legends uh, where we just had some great folk who've been in the industry for a while and we could ask them anything. It was it was just great. So we've we've got 600 and I think it's actually 80. I had a look this morning, 680 members. And um, so, yeah, if you would like to join, um, please find us on LinkedIn. Um, and thank you very much. That's the QR code again for our guidelines. Um, if you if you missed it the first time. Thank you. Happy to take any questions at all. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. What an amazing talk. Um, I mean, yeah, it's lovely to hear your story and, you know, how you've shaped and kind of grown accessibility at Skyscanner. Um, we've got loads of questions, so I'll try and get through as many as I can. Um, and yeah, get right into it. Um, so, um, first question. So we've got quite a few questions around the Empathy Lab. Um, so I'll try and kind of group them together. Um, so, I mean, I mean, first of all, Nikki, Nikki Patel asks, uh, what advice would you have for creating a portable version of the Empathy Lab uh, when we don't have a dedicated space in the office? Good question, because I'm actually trying to work that out right now. Um, we, we have just done our first external version of the lab where we took everything to Edinburgh University and we did a lab there. Um, but I'm trying to do a smaller version. Um, so our lab consists at the moment of nine different stations. Some of them need a lot of room, but a lot of them are just a laptop, maybe with a pair of vision, um, vision impairment simulation glasses. So... Um, I'm going to be doing one at another conference I'm talking at uh, in June and where I'm going to we're going to set up a mini lab outside so if I had four stations I would need four desks four computers maybe some of the glasses if we were doing those simulating those disabilities um, and I just have basically the material I have on the you might have seen it in the video but I have a perspex stand with the task in there so um that's kind of all uh, all I would need I would be able to pack that into into a box and take it with me but um there is uh something that we like um it's a online um disability simulator called Funkify and we actually use that as part of our lab on one of the one of our stations that is purely online so if you were wanting to do something remote um I would I would recommend that tool again it's simulations only 
bit much better to speak to someone with lived experience but it's a, it's a great it's quite fun tool as well and if you if you buy the license for it it's not expensive um you get a little auditing tool as part of it as well so yeah that's what I do if I'm doing some training online um and I'm trying to get a message across I'll, I'll get people to to download Funkify and we do that brilliant thank you um so we've got another question um just on the empathy lab as well um saying uh apologies if i missed you addressing uh apologies if i missed you addressing this uh but were the empathy labs designed by people with the specific disabilities and lived experiences being simulated some of them were and some of them weren't um so i would say our the stations that focus on neurodiversity were designed um, by neurodiverse colleagues of mine um, but the other ones no and I think that would be a really nice touch actually we, we would get a lot more insight if we did do it that way that was a good idea. Thank you. Um, so next question from Giada who asks uh, Heather in your view uh, what are the most important qualities and skills that an accessibility champion should have? um not being scared to put your hand up all the time to say have you thought about this group of people can we consider this group of people is that going to work for someone on a screen reader um so not being scared to actually question if something has been done correctly or not um all of the the accessibility champions we have are are really passionate like genuinely genuinely care so i think I don't think a model would work where we said, okay, out of these 10 teams, we want one accessibility champion per team. And it was a forced thing. I think to be a champion, you have to want to do it because you care about it for um, whatever reason that is. And there's multiple reasons to care. So I think that genuine, that genuineness uh, is, a, is, a, is a good skill, uh, if that's a skill. Um, it's great to be able to share why we're doing this and have that quite compelling um, story or narrative behind what you're doing. Um, and also be able to talk to different people in different ways. So if I'm talking to the head of engineering, I will be focusing on different things than if I was talking to um, the head of design because they care about different things. So being mindful of all of the different elements of, of accessibility and picking out the things that are actually gonna hit home with whoever, you're talking to I, I think is great and just being a bit persistent but without being annoying that's that's key thank you um, so Jada also asks um what what are the main barriers what, what are the main barriers that you encounter on a daily basis um and if you have any insight on how you try to overcome them the big the big one I would say is prioritization so if we are if we've found some bugs and we want to get them fixed um there will be a million other things that that particular team are trying to do at the same time and it's you know how do you prioritize accessibility over security or over um, something being um very broken for another group of travelers or it that is the challenge i think um and the way i'm trying to get around that is something that we've been trying to do for years is actually to embed accessibility into our all of our processes all the way from design all the way through to um to testing and getting things out there live if, if, the, if it's embedded in there all across the board we're not going to have the issues we're not going to have to have all these bugs and um have have the problems so that's the aim it just becomes part of what everyone does and then it's just a natural part of the process um it would that would solve a huge a huge number of problems i think also a, a big problem is knowledge gap um actually so uh even though people have great intentions sometimes they don't have the knowledge on how to make something accessible um and that comes back to i think education is like a lot of particularly software developers if you're doing a computer science degree you're not learning about accessibility or the only courses that you're being offered are optional ones, op an optional optional module. It doesn't seem to be part of, it's not ingrained into the curriculum as I feel it should. So there's, I think there's a lot to be done in that space, making um, students 
learn about accessibility from a design side and the development side and everything in between so that again it's just that natural part it doesn't have to be that add-on that you're you're you know you're fighting for time to get to get things done yeah yeah absolutely I mean that's that is something that's something Alistair um spoke about uh yesterday I mean it's just crazy that there's no kind of formal accessibility kind of education within kind of formal courses it's, it's crazy yep. Let's <laughs> um, change that. yeah uh, so Lizzie has our next question um and Lizzie asks uh, do you have any advice for teams who are at the beginning of this journey uh, I lead an accessibility task force but we're only just securing budget and have been having to do everything manually so far and um, what would you say are the key priorities when you don't uh yet have as much business buy-in as you'd like Oh, it's really hard. I think you've got to just start with raising awareness. If you can raise awareness across as much of the business as possible, you'll get people, people will start following what you're doing and start wanting to join in with what you're doing. Um, and getting that hard hitting stuff as well. Like the, as I said about the um if you're if you're building products, getting someone using a screen reader to try and get through a journey on your product video it share it uh, if, if it's okay with them um and you know if you if, if accessibility isn't something you're focused on at the moment in your business it's more than more than likely it's going to be a pretty terrible experience for a screen reader user show people that because nobody wants that nobody nobody is, is happy with that um so that's that's how you get that additional buy-in um also finding the right as I said before, actually finding the right things to talk about to different people, what pushes their buttons. Some people just just care about the metrics. Other people only care about the moral reasons to do this. Um, there's there's a million different ways to talk about accessibility and to sell it in. Um, and just being just thinking about who your audience is at uh, different times is is beneficial. But it's it's hard starting out. Um, I think. Yeah, your task force is a, is a great thing to do um, and upskilling your task force with there's a lot of free online training as well. Um, and there's loads of training out there that, that people can do, maybe start in like a weekly session of a half an hour. Everyone watches a video together or something. Um, getting that knowledge up while you while you've got time to do it would be really good, really worthwhile. Thank you. Um, so James asks, uh, does your customer support or customer service teams get involved with accessibility uh, in terms of having kind of key information in regards to user feedback, insights and complaints surrounding accessibility? Are there any processes in place for your users to reach out uh, about any accessibility issues they're facing? Good questions. So our customer service team is all digital, so it's all uh, it's all done online. Um, and yes, actually, one of my pod leads, uh, so the person who leads the marketing and comms pod, is a senior um, user satisfaction consultant. So he every day is replying to users who are having problems with whatever part of the the travel journey and um, that they're telling us about and that does include accessibility so whenever there's an accessibility related complaint or um even just a note saying hey this is great um it automatically gets put into our accessibility slack channel so we can all see it um and i i help respond to to those um and actually some if we can, if it's something that something's not working for someone, we always go back and ask exactly, you know, what platform were you using uh, or what device are you on? Could you tell us a bit more about it? I've had conversations with travelers from that, you know, people have said they, they couldn't get past this part. And we said, could, could we have a chat? So we've had a chat and we've recorded what they're saying and learned from it. Um, we had someone actually uh, get in touch as well around, um, they have this uh, vestibular disorder, so feeling a bit um, ill when things are moving too much on a screen. And we had a great chat with him, learned a lot more about vestibular disorder. Um, and I've actually just gone back to him last week saying, try it now. I think it's better. Um, so I haven't heard from him. But yeah, so the the user satisfaction team actually we have a number of accessibility champions in that team and i know that they have shared information about accessibility with the rest of the team 
so it's 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 a yeah they are a they're a knowledgeable bunch um and they very much look out for the accessibility related um queries coming in thank you um so i've noticed we do have uh quite a few questions um just asking you um what you use to get your kind of um tabbing sequence <laughs> a lot of people oh, yeah. <laughs> um it's a free um chrome extension called um, accessibility insights and it is fantastic so yeah you can just hit tab order and it'll bring up those numbers you can also hit headings and it'll show you um the heading levels on on a, on a web page and um, there's loads of other things in as well it goes it can go into quite a lot of detail if you want it to but i tend to just use it for those quick quick checks uh, it's pretty effective so accessibility insights chrome extension awesome thank you um so you probably have time for just one or two super quick questions um so joe asks uh do you not feel that making one person responsible can in fact promote more burnout within digital accessibility, especially? Um, or have you found being able to surround yourself with a team dedicated, uh, a team of dedicated and passionate people helps to delegate the responsibility? Um, as I speak with many people that experience burnout within accessibility. Burnout is actually the topic of our next uh, CAN meetup. So if you would like to be part of that, that would be amazing. Um, I'm looking for speakers. Um, so yeah, one person responsible, I don't feel responsible for the accessibility of our products. I feel responsible for running an accessibility program within Skyscanner and keeping it on track, keeping pushing, keeping wanting more, trying to embed it more. That's maybe the difference. Um, we're all responsible for making what we do more accessible. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel the burnout, but I do know that it is very common uh, in our industry for people to feel it. I think it's a lot to do with the fact you're constantly pushing, you're pushing for something that you deeply care about, and it's not always granted to you, um, which can be very exhausting. Um, Plus, a lot of people are on their own uh, doing this. I, I feel lucky that I've got that whole Champions Network behind me. And they are doing it on this volunteer basis. They've all got, you know, their main jobs. But I still feel so, so much support from them. Um, I can turn to any of them and ask them anything, which is great. So building that team, however you do it, um, there's lots of different ways to do it. In fact, at our last CAN meetup, we talked about this, the, the topic was building an accessibility team. And um, we had Paul Smythe there from um, HS, no, Barclays, sorry, Barclays. He's got a team of 24 people, uh, which is phenomenal. Uh, I've got I've got me and just recently an uh, um, accessibility lead engineer, which is amazing, but on a 12 month project basis. So yeah, it's a very different situation, um, but it depends how you feel about it and how you can try and delegate and how you can inspire volunteers to to do work um, on this important subject as well. Um, but re recognition is a big element of it as well. I think um, it can be quite easy for people in this role to be pushing and pushing and pushing. And if the company is not 100% behind it, it can be demoralizing and the recognition won't be there. Um, so it's about finding finding the right people at the top who, who do care about it as well and helping you move forward so that um, you can get places and it, it, it can be recognised. It's something that the whole recognition piece is actually something that our positive impact group are looking at a lot at the moment. How do we recognise the work that these amazing volunteers are doing over and above their normal job? Um, so that's that's a big piece. And without that, it, it, that can lead to burnout, I think, as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. That is just about all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Um, I know we still do have lots of uh, questions unanswered. They were coming in quicker than I could ask them. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure people wanted to reach out to you on, on LinkedIn or um, then, yes, please, um, please do that. Um, all the and we'll, we can try and um, answer some ourselves. Um, uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. That was a fantastic talk and awesome Q&A. And thank you for everyone that tuned in also. 
Um, we'll be back in uh, about an hour uh, with Richard Morton, who is Head of Accessibility at the Central Digital and Data Office, uh, with his talk, uh, Digital Accessibility in Recruitment. Um, thanks again, Heather, and we'll, and we'll see everyone back in about an hour. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.